that way too, which is super cool, super cool. So um, it's hard to learn meaningful stuff uh, when, when there's fear, just like a fat. So it's like, we're gonna learn stuff. We're gonna get you out of comfort zone a little bit into learning zone. We're gonna recognize when we're in panic dissociation zone. We're gonna to work together to get it all balanced out. So we can learn stuff. It's gonna be super. Boy, you sure got a lot of information last time though, didn't you? Electronegativity, oof. Did you go home and not think about it? Yes. Because that was the assignment, was to go home and not think about it. Does it make more sense now that you've not thought about it? <laughs> Maybe the first time you've been asked that question. I appreciate that. Right. Long story short, most electronegative things are where? Up here, least electronegative are here. Are you pointing here? Show me. Here. Show me. Here. Here. Least electronegative is here. So these things up here are pulling electrons toward it pretty hard, right? This is the thing to remember. These things up here are pulling electrons toward the nucleus pretty hard. These things down here are actually like pushing electrons away from itself pretty hard, right? So these things over here are like sort of pushing electrons off onto these things over here. Or conversely, these things over here are pulling on the electrons from these things over here. So the ones in the bottom are pushing this way up? Yeah, most of the time when these elements here are in the proximity of, or sometimes even in water, uh, with these things over here, they will literally like just like lose the outermost electron. That single valence electron will just go off into, into the void. And they'll be what we call an ion, which we'll talk about today. Bless you. So when we left, I think we were talking about covalent bonds, yeah. correct? That's my shorthand for an electron. Made by sharing valence electrons, correct? Yes. Yeah. When are they polar? When is the covalent bond polar? You would the answer would be. They are covalent bonds are polar when that's when they're covalent. When are they polar covalent? When there's it's like when one is the photons are bigger than the other two that they're sharing, so there's an actual part. Yes. And no. And let's just say yes and. How can we supplement that response? Um, I have, I, I might read it wrong, it says electro, it's EN, but I'm assuming I meant electronegative numbers are different, we get polar. So like when the electronegativity is different, the more different the electronegativity, the more polar it's going to be, the more polar it's going to be. Ooh, we can make a graph. We can make a, do you want to make a graph? <laughs> that was the most unenthusiastic single yes I've ever heard, All right? Uh, raise your hand if you have no opinion, All right? <laughs> Yeses? Who wants to make a graph? Let me rephrase the question. Who wants me to make a graph? <laughs> Who does not want to make a graph? Who is brave? 
you can help us out with this one. You can help us out with this one. We can make this cute little graph. And I like I like thinking about this as a graph because when the book, like whatever the who like whoever wrote the book, right? When we say the book says, let's keep in mind that these are actual individuals. Let's also keep in mind that it's like a bio 101 class. This is not a chemistry course. But this has consequences a little bit later on, what we're about to talk about. When we think about covalent bonds, a lot of times we either think about them as being polar or nonpolar. Okay? I mean, it's just there are two kinds of covalent bonds, the polar ones and the nonpolar ones. Saying a bond is polar and nonpolar sort of represents the extremes here. Polarity of a bond is actually a continuum. Right? So bonds can be like a little bit polar, they can be like a lot polar, they can be nonpolar, they can be superpolar. So we can say bonds are polar or nonpolar. They actually exist on a polarity spectrum. All right. In some, it's like when you bond nitrogen and oxygen, it's like it's polar, but it's like it's it's that polar. I mean, the electronegativities are very similar. So it's not meaningfully polar, you would almost say. So if we're looking at covalent bonds, like looking at covalent bonds between things, on one axis, we have the difference in electronegativity. So if the difference in electronegativity, so like when we compare the electronegativity values between two, two things, the two things in the covalent bond, if they are the same, like if it's a carbon-carbon bond or an oxygen-oxygen bond, the difference is zero. Good, right, 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 right. Um, and over here, the difference can be like, I don't know, two is about as much as you're gonna get. Like if you can compare meaningful values. So if the, and over here is the degree of polarity where down here is nonpolar and up here is superpolar. If there is no difference in electronegativity, the bond is going to be, where would the be? Yeah, it'd be like right here. If the difference in electronegativity between the two bonding partners is like, a little bit, bond polarity is going to be up. Right where? Super. Is it going to be super? No, 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 no. It's going to be like yeah. moderate, moderate, appreciable, B minus polarity. If there's a super difference in electronegativity, then up. the degree of polarity is going to be like. Superstar, it kind of goes like that. So again, when we read the textbook and we talk about this, we say bonds are either nonpolar or they're polar. It's like, that sort of exists. There's a, there's a spectrum here. And that spectrum is based on how different the electronegativity is in the bonding partners. Yeah, cool. An example of this would be like a carbon-carbon bond. The example of this would be like a hydrogen oxygen bond or something like that. An example of this would be like a carbon nitrogen bond or something like that. Wait, example of this, the carbon the CC is which one? This is like a, a covalent bond between two carbon atoms. Because they're the same thing with the same electronegativity, the difference is going to be zero. So like this is an example of a zero electronegative nonpolar bond. This is an example of a it's a little bit different electronegativity, so it's a little bit polar, but not too polar. Here's an example of a, there's a huge difference here. It's like 2.1 and 3.5, give or take. You know, so that's going to be a super polar, super polar thing. Is that good? That's good. Sound good? Perfect. Let's take a picture of this now. Why? This is the first time I've ever made this graph. Oh. <laughs> whoop, whoop. 
Professor, they are, hang on, I'm getting a call. I can talk to them later. This is why my phone's always in selfie mode. Which I'll noticing right now that professor you signed up for and paid a lot of money to might be an idiot. Okay. Very cool. Does so that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Perfect. 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 We're done with covalent bonds, right? We can be done with those for a while. Mm -hmm. They are so last week. We can move on. The bond ionic. What's a good example of a molecule that has an ionic bond? Yeah, yeah like common table salt is a perfect example. Awesome. Plus, awesome. You've heard of salt. Yes. <laughs> we started and we work our way up. Squeeze tube from the bottom, right, and you know, flatten as you go up. Uh, sodium, how do you draw sodium? What would it be? Where is it? 11, so it's 11 protons, neutrons, who cares about neutrons? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? How many on the inner? Next one out. And yay. Chlorine. Take five minutes, right, while I draw chlorine. <coughs> 17 protons, perfect. Two, right. See, am I doing this right? Yes. Balance electrons. Balance electrons. It seems like the perfect setup for a covalent bond, right? I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if they just like shared and everything was great? And why can't we just live in harmony with each other? Do we still have our electronegativity diagram from last week? That one? Do we still have that? Uh, what's the electronegativity of sodium? 0.9. Wait, is it not? Wait, no, is that? Yeah, it is. It's like below one. Yeah. Goodness me. What is the electronegativity of chlorine? Three. Three? So like that would be on our covalent graph that I just erased, <laughs> foolishly. That's like beyond, right? That's like beyond the, it's like over here on this side of the board. Three. Goodness me, the difference is 2.1 difference. That's a huge difference. This ion over here, the soon to be ion, this atom over here is so electronegative, especially compared to this one, that it will like literally steal the electron and put it over here. It's like, it is not covalent. It is not sharing this electron. It is not saying, you know what? Hey, we could both be happy here. 
This is more of a, you know what? I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to take it. Super stable. You know, what's interesting about this ion now, what makes it an ion, is that it now does not have a neutral charge. It has 17 protons, correct? How many electrons does it have? 18. Yeah, it has 18 because it's at 17. Now it has 18 electrons, which gives it a charge of one. negative one. Which, uh, and so when molecules, when uh, atoms out there have an actual electrical charge associated with them in their like whatever state, we call them ions, I-O-N, right? And since this is a negative, Ready for this chemistry, folks? Ready for this one? You're gonna love it. Since this one is negative, this is a negative ion. Whoa. I know. I know. So we call this an an ion, a negative ion. Um, no, that's not what that actually means. <laughs> But it works, but it works. Um, so when it takes the electron from the other, from sodium, why does it become negative one? Because it, it has its original 17 protons, but now it has 18 electrons. Oh, so okay. it, you get electron, you get a charge of balance because mm -hmm. it's not the equal number of electrons of protons. Mm -hmm. Cool, got it, perfect. So this one is like, not only does this lose, the outermost electron, because it lost the outermost electron, it has actually lost the entire shell. We call these cations, and they have a charge of plus one. Both of these atoms are totally happy with this relationship. Why? You know, because it's like, whoa, bro, you stole my electron. I don't like that. No, he's like, no, go ahead and take it. It's fine. This one's like, cool, because this actually is an arrangement that works. Why so? Why are these so stable as ions? Because they're outer. Yes. They both have a full valence shell. So now they're both acting like noble gases. So it's like when you talk about covalent bond, when you when you stop bonding stuff covalently, it's like when all the valence shells are full. Awesome, valence shells are full, but they did it a different way. They didn't do it by electron sharing, they did it by electron taking. And they could do that because the difference in electronegativity is big enough to get over the fact that there's a charge of balance in the outer shell. And then when you have Fluoride takes that extra um, electron, it becomes, oh, what's it called? And this one has a positive charge. This one has a negative charge. So what do these two ions do? They go, yeah, do that like for the class. Look, they go. Okay, class, let's do it on three. One, two, three. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three. One more for the back folks in the back. One, two, three. Three. Awesome. And we form a bond that is ionic. So it's not an actual bond bond. It's an electrostatic attraction. So there's no like linkage situation going on here. Right? But the, the difference in charge is so perfect because nothing was gained or lost in terms of charge overall. But an electron moved, which gave you a perfectly balanced charge separation. So they... There's a perfectly balanced charge separation, so they attract each other. So they <laughs> So for the rest of your life, right? When everybody says, what's the next bond you're gonna go? <laughs> go ahead, Celine. Um the plus one or negative one, is that just dependent on how much it loses or gains? Yes. Yeah. So some things exist as like a negative two or and a positive two. Mm -hmm. That's about as far as they go. That's about as far as they go. So things in the second column, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, 
Barium? I think B is barium, right? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Boron. Bor boron is boron is up here. I think this is barium. Oh, I thought you were going to Yeah, I got a B, A. Yeah, so everything in, in this row is going to exist as a plus one. Right? Everything over here is going to exist as a plus two. It'll, it'll dump two electrons off. So you can get um, ionic bonds between, typically, ionic bonds can exist between things in the first two columns and things over here in 17. So when you're when you're getting the proximity of either columns one and two or seventeen close to each other, they're going to form ionic bonds. Typically, with some exceptions. I mean, you can form covalent bonds with hydrogen, but hydrogen is weird for all kinds of reasons. Um, so this stuff bonded to this stuff is typically going to be an ionic bond. Okay, so you can get uh, lithium fluoride. Sodium chloride, potassium bromide, potassium fluoride, lithium bromide, uh, potassium iodide, right? So all of these things are what we would call salt, a salt, right? And if you get any of these wrong on homeworks or exams, <laughs> bless you, you're committing a crime. A salt. <laughs> Question. So the plus one will normally be the one like that atom. If it's like the plus one, it'll usually be the one that's losing. It will always be the one that's losing. And the negative would be the gaining one. Always going to be the gaining one. Okay. Always the less electronegative, always the more electronegative. Okay. Chad, that electronegativity thing is like keeps coming back to get us, doesn't it? Go ahead. Um, besides hydrogen, is rose that are. Column 17 the only ones that have I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, it's always column 17. Okay. So it's like it's column 1 and 2 with something in column 17. Or form salt. You can get some like weird organic kind of stuff that you could call a salt, which is like this bigger ionic whatever that you might be able to get away with calling it a salt. But for the most part, for our purposes, it's column 1 and 2 with something from 17. And so when you do something with column two, because it's a two plus, with something from 17, you get like magnesium dichloride. You get two chlorines that ionically attract, each one with a negative one attracting to the positive two, which is good. We've now like left biology and we've entered chemistry. So we can have this conversation pretty much right here if we're good. Ionic? Cool. I can draw another graph. Would you like to draw another graph? No. Would you like me to draw another graph? Yes. Should I do it here again? Sure. Mm -hmm. How do I want to do this one? I have done this one before. How do I want to do this one? Uh, it's less a graph than a picture. It's a it's a figure. This is going to be figure one for lecture today. It's going to go like this. Difference in electronegativity of bonding partners. You with me? So over here we have like no difference. What kind of bond is that? Non-polar. Somebody's answering fast, I can get it on the right answer. Non-polar covalent, correct? Example. Or Oxygen, oxygen, or like literally anything on the period, right? Hydrogen, yeah, hydrogen, hydrogen. Awesome. Difference in electronegativity is if it's like two or so, 1.5 to two. What kind of bond is that? What kind of covalent? Fancy.
Examples. <laughs> or. Water. Stuff like that. Difference in electronegativity, two plus, what kind of bond is that? Ionic. Ionic. For example? Salt salt. Yeah, like an actual example. And it's yell. Hold on. Same, but just put together like the further, like left with the other right. Can you like do it for real? So do it, do it, do it. Pick something from the top of column one and something from the top of column seven. Not hydrogen, no hydrogen is weak. Oh, pick one. The top of column one. Something from the top of column one that's not hydrogen. Pick one. That's not sodium. Uh, lithium. lithium. Lithium and something from 17 that's not chlorine. Bromine. Yeah. Lithium bromide. <laughs> it's a salt. Lithium bromide. Lithium bromide. Right. All salts are the ionic bonds. Everything, everything of uh, two uh, different. What is the te textbook definition of, of, of a salt? Two uh, two elements, two two ions bonded together electrostatically. Right, where one's an anion, one's a full cation, and the electrostatic attraction holds them together as a salt. Questions about ionic bonds. What does it say where it says cool with the green after is that H O H? Water, H O H. Right. H2O. 1.5 to 2? Oh. Yeah, one, so it's like if electronegativity difference is 1.5 to 2, we stop calling it nonpolar and we start calling it polar. Right? Once we start getting in this direction, once we have a bigger difference of like two, then it's not, it goes from 99% to 1%. Superpolar to, you know what, 100%, 0%. So in that regard, an ionic bond is just the extreme case of the polar covalent bond. The polar covalent bond is so polar that it actually takes the electron and it becomes ionic. So myth number two, we think of ionic bonds as something that's very, very different than a covalent bond. All you're doing is going from sharing to taking of the, of the, of the electron. What do you think? It all makes sense, Celine, doesn't it? It all just, it's all just one big thing. It's all just one big thing. This is the custom. Oof. Let's take a selfie with my diagrams. Questions, this makes sense? Perfect. Chemistry is easy. Do you understand it? Yes. Chemistry is easy. Give yourself the credit to maybe think that you understand this and it's chemistry. It can be okay to like math. You know, this question because it was like question 14 there what makes ionic bonds different from covalent bonds. And I answered it because I found it on the book, but I couldn't get it. Do you get it now? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, question 14, what makes ionic bonds different than covalent bonds? Mm -hmm. That's it. You're not bond sharing your electron stealing. Question. Am, am I allowed to ask a question about uh, one of the right things? Yeah, totally. Um, question. What's it about? Um, it's the one right before it. 13? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't know how exactly. I made a guess. I just kind of want to know. What'd you guess? Uh, 
Correct. Really? Yes. Because it's not a group. It's a it's an element. Oh, I I went like I, I don't know. I started drawing stuff. I I don't know. I love drawings. All of your homework for next week is drawings. Oh, my Perhaps I said that too soon. I should have waited to the end of class to say that. Yeah, that's so when I was on that way. Yeah, yeah. All the, all the homework for next week is drawings. It's great. It's great. Good job. Thanks, man. Welcome. Good job. Good job. Okay, Ionic's done. What you say? Yeah. Yes. Fun with chemistry. Fun with chemistry. Hydrogen bond design. Check this out. Hydrogen bonds. Ready for this one? You in the back, you ready for this one? Coming in hot. Good? Everybody? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's draw water uh, the fast way. By that I mean like that. We know what we're doing at this point, right? I mean, we can shortcut this a little bit. Cool. Bunch of water. Here's a bunch of water. You with me? Water? Bunch of like water molecules. Cool. If we draw our water molecule a little bit larger, what kind of bond is this? Polar, Polar covalent. Why? Because what? Oh, you started it. Now you got to finish it. You took a bite, you gotta finish the plate. Well, what if I'm wrong? I said it was right. Oh, okay. I, I, I love, you just asked the best question ever. Okay. Class, what if she's wrong? What's gonna happen? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just the, the highest risk we face every day is social judgment, right? What's gonna happen if she's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. More, I mean, is gonna be, what are we going to do if she's wrong, though? Help. Help. Want to help guide, converge on something like that? If you're wrong, we get the possibility for Ooh, awesome a conversation. So why is this polar? Why, why is that covalent bond polar? It's about these things. The electron activity is different, yeah. right? Because the 3.5, correct? 2.1? Hydrogen 2.1? Yeah. yeah. I've done this enough times that I actually remember the electron negativity values. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me like any of the other ones. I think carbons, I don't even know. Um, that's pretty big. It's like a one and a half difference in electronegativity. That bond is pretty polar. That bond is pretty polar. Not the difference is not so much that it's ionic. It is polar covalent though. Most of the electrons are over on this side, being pulled over in this way. So if we drew the valence electrons here, we'd put them like there. Most of the time, they're getting pulled in the oxygen direction, which makes the oxygen, because it is 
based on the polarity of this bond and this bond, more in association with extra electrons. So this doesn't become an anion, a fully negatively charged thing, uh, because these bonds are covalent. These electrons do occasionally go out here by the hydrogen, but they usually don't. So this is partially negative twice, and these hydrogens are partially positive. More often than not, their lone electron is being pulled over to the oxygen side. So there's like positive charge-ish down here, and there's negative charge-ish up here. You with me? Not full-on ionic, so it's not like a full charge of like one in the difference. It's like uh, two-thirds, kind of whatever it might be. But the oxygen signs tend negative in their charge. The, uh, the hydrogen signs tend positive in their charge, okay? Yes. Good. So here's a partially positive hydrogen, and here's a partially hydro negative oxygen. What are these two things going to do? This one's partially positive, that one's partially negative. Okay. Okay. You, have to, you can make a sound. They're going to... Class? Kind of, kind of. So like when one at one point has the electrons in the H and then another has the electrons in the O, is that what you're talking about? When they have like the electrons in different locations at the same time, that's when they attract? When the, the electrons are being pulled toward the oxygen because it's more electronegative. Right, but what makes the hydrogen uh, like negative? The hydrogen's a little positive. This is actually a plus sign. No, right. But you said there's one that's like negative and one's... The oxygen is the partially negative, the hydrogen is partially positive. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. And so you get like this... It's not. It's like an ionic bond, but it's like it's a partial ionic bond. It's just like an electrostatic attraction. You wouldn't use the word ionic at all, right? It's like uh, partially negative, partially positive. So they sort of... They sort of hang out. They like, ooh, your partial charge bounces out my partial charge, so let's kind of electrostatically associate with each other, which is pretty cool. So these dotted lines here are hydrogen bonds. There's a hydrogen bond. So here's my, the, the, the essay question on the exam that I'm not gonna give you, but I have in the past in my younger years, would be, what is the basis for a hydrogen bond? Because the hydrogen bond is not because there's a hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond is because of, like that hydrogen bond exists because of that bond and that bond. How do these bonds here make that bond happen? So the hydrogen bond is actually the result of the polar covalent bond over here. You get that? It's like because the hydrogen oxygen bond here on the water molecules themselves are strongly polar covalent, the result of that is hydrogen bond interactions between the molecules in the solution. So it's like, it's emergent. It's an emergent bond out of a polar covalent bond elsewhere. Does that make sense? Kind of? So like, is it a bond? It's like, it's sort of a bond. It's an electrostatic attraction, but the real driver of it is the difference in the, in the electronegativity of the covalent bonds of the actual molecules themselves in the thing. So it's an interaction between molecules. It's not a within molecule like ionic and polar is, it's a between molecule attraction for the ninth time, the basis of which is the polar covalent bond within the molecule itself. Hmm? Makes sense, kinda? 
You. Yeah. Awesome. So are you going to get hydrogen bonds showing up in nonpolar solutions? No, no. 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 It's only in polar molecules where you get hydrogen bonds. Ammonia, you get hydrogen bonds in there. Water, you get tons of you get all hydrogen bonds in there. You get tons of them, and they're strong. They're strong. And what you can see, I, I drew this one in particular. This water molecule here, in a solution like in a glass of water or a bottle of water, or whatever it might be, every 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 water molecule that you have, every water molecule, is held in place by four other hydrogen bonds. So, like in solution, for every one water molecule you have, you have four hydrogen bonds attached to it. Because of that, you get. These weird properties of water, like cohesion, you get adhesion. Water sticks to itself. Which makes surface tension. Yeah, which makes surface tension. Mm -hmm. And what really makes surface tension, like, like, so the question is, like, why do bugs walk? Why can some bugs walk on water? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, if you have, uh, who's got a like a water bottle, like a bottle with water in it? I'll say two things. One, recycle that when you're done with it. And two, hold it up, right? So hold it up for all of us to enjoy. Perfect. Yay. So um, there is a whole lot of water in this bottle, and there's a volume to it. And all the water in the volume of the water bottle is doing this. Each water molecule is attached to four others through hydrogen bonding. Yes. The water on the surface is different, like on the very top layer. That water is a little bit different. And that water is different because you can take it, yeah, you can. Here's your water bottle. Obviously, this is water because it has waves on the top of it. It's a very large water bottle, so here's a dude surfing on it. Going that way, so it's a giant water bottle, okay? All of this water in here Right, you have all this water that's all covalently bonded to each other. The water on the surface is different. Over here, the surface tension is distributed, or the, uh, the adhesion, I should say the cohesion in this case, is distributed. This is an arrow pointing towards you three dimensionally, like in three dimensions all around it. So that adhesion that you get with those hydrogen bonds is going off in three dimensional directions. On the surface, The water molecules and the tension between them, the hydrogen bonding, is distributed in essentially uh, half of a sphere. So laterally and just kind of behind it. So the on the actual surface layer of the water molecule itself, the hydrogen bonds are not distributed in a three-dimensional space. They're more distributed in two-dimensional space. So you get a, a little bit of a springier layer on it. So it's like once you break this surface tension, you're right to the bottom. Right? But it's like as long as you don't break it. So there's like a little, there's a watery, I don't want to say scum layer, right? But when you open the lid on a on a jello pudding and you leave it out for an hour, and there's like it's still pudding on the top, but it's a little more resilient. It's like it's like that, right? So you still have the same number of hydrogen bonds, but they're spread out laterally a lot more, which gives you a tension layer on the top that bugs can stand on. You can't. Bugs can. Which is kind of cool. So it's really just like a dimensionality thing. Good, 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 perfect. So hydrogen bonds, it's an electrostatic attraction that's driven by polar covalent bonds elsewhere. Ooh, I can draw a graph. Want me to draw a graph? <laughs> Will you be okay if I draw a graph anyway? I'm gonna draw a graph. I want to do this one. Maybe I want to draw, draw a graph. Maybe it just left me. We'll see. So, because the hydrogen bond 
is like sort of based on the polar covalent bond over here. Polar covalent bonds can be graded in their sort of electronegativity and no polarity, which means the hydrogen bond can be graded a little bit in its strength. Since it's not a bond, it's an attraction. So if you have a little here, strength of hydrogen bond, it's like none, and this is high. Hydrogen bonds, do they exist and are they strong in nonpolar solutions? No. In moderately polar solutions, how strong can hydrogen bonds be? Moderate. Makes sense. <laughs> In like superpolar covalent bond solutions like water, how strong can the hydrogen bonds be? Super, super strong hydrogen bonds. Example of this would be like an oil. Example here would be like ammonia. Example here would be like water. Water. How's my graph game today? He's making sense? He's making sense? So we've taken all the different bonds and we've turned them into one. We've turned them into one. Everything is covalent or the basis of covalent. So when you think about covalent bonds, it's like, great, we'll do some electron sharing in valent shells. Um, and that's all great. We'll do that till, until the shell is full. However, if there are different electronegativity, then they're not going to be sharing the electrons equally. And so the more electronegative is going to be pulling the bond, the electrons for that. So the bond is going to be nonpolar. If the difference in electronegativity is super high, which you can only get between a bond between the first two columns and the last one, then they're not going to bond share. They're actually going to pull the electron all the way off of it. And you're going to get a bond that's ionic. However, in those polar covalent bonds, you can, because of the polarity of that bond, get these electrostatic attractions between the hydrogen and the electronegative thing of its neighbor, and those bonds are going to be hydrogen. hydrogen. All bonds are no one. Question? Can you explain what makes Whose mind is blown about this? No one? <laughs> Mine is. My mind gets blown by every time I talk about it. Can you explain what makes a bond cohesive? Yeah, well, cohe um, the bond isn't cohesive. The solution is cohesive. It sticks to itself. So if I take some water and I pour it up here, it's not going to like scatter and not different, all, all the different molecules and blow off in the state. It's going to form droplets. It's going to form droplets. And it's like the water sticks to itself. And it's like to stick two water drops together, all you have to do is like put your finger between them and it'll go flunk and it'll stick together. Yes. So the act of the bond makes it cohesive, not the bond itself. The hydrogen bonds between the molecules in the solution result in cohesivity, the property of cohesion that you get in water. So you can see this relationship. If I can draw a graph um, <laughs> on. The difference in the left, I could do it. Ooh, I can do, do like a three-dimensional graph. It's like the the po difference in polarity of the bonding partners. So like the, the electronegativity difference, bond polarity, and degree of cohesivity of the solution. So the more different electronegative the bonding partners are, the more polar the molecule is going to be, the stronger the hydrogen ion, the hydrogen bonds are going to be, the more cohesive it's going to be. That was a four-dimensional graph. I ran, out of, I ran out of board dimensions two dimensions ago. What do you think? 
So like all bonds are sort of, you can describe them all in one sentence that flows. Right? Can we take a picture of this? Look at the test. Perfect. Can I race? So adhesion is when it gets closer to the nonpolar side? Adhesion? Yeah. Um, cohesion is the molecules sticking to themselves through hydrogen bonds. Mm -hmm. Adhesion, it's just like an adhesive. Like water sticks to a lot of other stuff too. Water has these like sticky properties. They adhere to other things. They adhere to other things. More about that as we get to it. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Okay, cool. So, what is this class? Water. Water. What kind of bond is this? Polar, polar covalent. Awesome. Which is most electronegative? Oh, Least electronegative? Hydrogen. Electronegativity value? 3.5. Hydrogen? 2.1. Where are the electrons in this bond? What? Where are the electrons in this bond? Two. Oh, two. Where are they? Oxygen. They're mostly down here. <laughs> that is a strange looking water molecule. Let me straighten out my bond here. Water is even weirder than that. Water is even weirder than that. It does this weird thing. It does a strange thing when you just like a bottle of water, like you do. It does this really strange thing. Just like randomly, universally, probabilistically, by its own self, without any motivation or driver than anything else, it'll go, whoopsie. And one of these things will kick off onto space. The bond just like, poof, and goes off into space and leaves. It's electron hanging out with the oxygen. This is now literally a proton floating in space in solution. Right? Because the nucleus of a hydrogen ion is like just a proton, like whatever. And this thing now has like this charge. negative charge. So you would say this is a proton or a Hydrogen ion, specifically of the cation variety. Yes? Yes, yes. And this is uh, called um, uh, hydroxide. hydroxide ion, which is of the, a, on the, uh, the onion variety, anion variety. Go ahead. So all the anions that gain an extra electron, you had IV to the end of the, the chemical name, right? Probably. Because I know it was the same with chlorine. That's a question that I'm thinking about from like 30 years ago when I took chemistry one. It was like, I think, I think, I think that's how the naming goes. Yeah. I think it does. Strangely, or perhaps not, simultaneously, you get these hydroxide ions that are occasionally rarely happening in your solution in a hydrogen ion, they'll come back together and form a water molecule. I know. So it's like they're, the water molecules are like in a pure water solution. They're sort of, you know, some of them are always just like spontaneously coming apart and then spontaneously coming together at a known given predictable rate. 
if we wanted to draw a chemistry equation like this, we would do something like, let me erase this over here because it's kind of junky anyway. With the O8? We would say H2O is in equilibrium separating into OH minus and a proton. And this reaction goes that way and it goes that way. Cool? So the question might be, it's like, okay, so that happens at a known constant rate that you can measure. So how much of this water at any given time is being converted over or kind of coming apart into the hydroxide and the hydrogen ion? What concentration of that water is now in this state? How much of it has come apart? And like if you just like pure water at standard temperature and pressure and all that kind of stuff, it is 0 0.000001 of it. What you can then do is like, well, that's a weird number. How can we make that into something we can use? Well, we can take the negative log of that and we get seven. It's like, oh, wow, cool. The partial pressure of hydrogen in water is seven. Let's call it pH. Neat. So at any given time in a pure water solution that has a pH of seven, it has that pH of seven because 0 0.0000001 of the water is now doing this. In water, we do that by measuring the amount of that. So what's fun for me is it's like, okay, so let's dump like a bunch more things in there that add to the number of hydrogen ions. So let's come up with a nice, what's a good acid out there? Chlor so Hydrochloric acid, right? If we put this, some HCl in that water, it's immediately gonna break apart into hydrogen and the chloride ion. If we then measure how much hydrogen ion there is in that bucket of water that was at the 0 0.0001, if we add to this by making that number go up, then this reaction is gonna get shoved in that direction. And now, if we add like a whole lot of this to that water, it's not gonna be 0 0.0001 because we're shoving it in this direction by adding more protons to it. So now it's like 0 0.0001, which equals a pH of four. One, two, three, four, right? It's like, wow, um, the number, the negative log of the concentration of protons has gone from 0 0.0001 to 0 0.0001, the negative log is going from seven to four. So this solution is now acid. acidic. Acidic. So anything with the pH lower than seven is an acid. Or We could add something like sodium hydroxide, which is going to break apart into sodium and a hydroxide ion and add it to this. If we do that, we're going to be taking that hydroxide, combining it with those hydrogen ions that are now getting kicked off. And in that, we are going to be lowering the amount of hydrogen ions. We're not adding to it. Now we're getting, we're vacuuming them up by adding a lot more hydroxide to them. That's going to take us to 0 0.0000001. That's going to give us a pH of like 10. So we can add things like 
HCl, which is going to add protons, dropping the pH by adding protons, or we can add things like sodium hydroxide, which is going to raise the pH by hoovering up the hydrogen ions that are out there, taking this out to like 10 decimal place. These things we refer to as a base. A base. My diagram and depiction here I know is very clear. It's very clear. I don't know why anyone would have any questions about what I just talked about based on that chalk diagram. You had to be there for it. This is one of those. Does this make sense? Like a little? A little, a little, a little. So the easiest way to tell a base from an acid is by putting a pH meter in it. Seven, neutral, less than seven. Acid, acid greater than seven, base. base. Now, I told you something last week, and I said, we'll get to that later. Good news, what time is it? Later. It's later. You ready for this? I don't know. I don't, I, don't, oh, I don't think you're ready for it, never mind. You wouldn't find it interesting. <laughs> what is it? So we can do this thing where it's like, you can draw some different compounds and you can predict if it's an acid or a base from the way that it looks. You've done, you do this all the time, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, we call those Friday night, you know? <laughs> HCl, acid or base? Acid. Acid. You're going to put it in water, the hydrogen's going to pop off, right? You're going to, hydrogen ion concentration is going to go up, pH is going to go from 7 to 4, whatever. Acid. Hydrogen fluoride. So acid. It's an acid, yeah. You put it in water, pops apart, whatever. Cation, anion, acidity. Goes down. You know, pH goes down, it's an acid. Base. Sodium hydroxide. Base. Splits apart, put some hydroxide in it, hoovers up the ions. The hydrogen ions get sucked out of solution to make more water from the OH. pH goes down. Uh, up, up, up. It's a base. See what happened? She was wrong. Wow. Did we what did we do to her? Stone. Public flogging, you, right? <laughs> you laugh. Uh, uh, base. It's a base, right? The hydroxide hoovers up the ho this hydrogen ions and pH goes up, up which makes it a base. Perfect. <laughs> redemption feels sweet. Yeah. The sweet taste of redemption. Perfect. Uh, H2CO3. Carbonic acid is a acid, acid or base? Base. <laughs> <laughs> so you put this in water, one of the hydrogen pops off, right? You get hydrogen plus, what's that, uh, bicarbonate ion, right? You get the bicarbonate ion. It's, a, it's an acid. This is the acid that's in your fizzy drinks, things like that, right? And you do that by taking uh, CO2. Well, it's H2O, and we get H2CO3, which then comes apart into H plus plus HCO3 minus, right? And your Coca-Cola is a little bit acidic, right, because of that, right? So what happens with the sodium and the chloride in the water? It's just in the water. Yeah, it's just in the water. It's just like doo -doo -doo. doing nothing. Doing nothing. Hanging out, right? doing nothing in terms of the consequences for pH, okay. right? But it's like it's there, but it's like, like I said, do do do, just sort of like chilling. chilling. It's holding the bags while the kids have fun. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Um, it kind of didn't make much sense. So the question or this? Oh me. Okay. I mean my question. Are you <laughs> sure? Makes sense. I did. I'm sorry. There's questions. <laughs> There are questions out there that, that have no answers. And those, those are questions like, why did my professor do that? Or <laughs> why would they say that? It's like, there's no answer to that. We all just do the best we can. But the question might be the question that was part of the path between there and here, right? And so we go through the questions and 
true wisdom says, you know, that's not the question, is it? Interesting, I'm curious. It was about Brita filters. Um, uh, yeah, because they got a lot of carbon, like charcoal, kind of charcoal filters in them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question, what I posed last week, and we'll end with this, goes thusly. Ask your base. Acid. Base. Acid. 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 Strong base. What? It's a really strong base. Yes! <laughs> it's a really strong base. But where's the OH? Exactly. Exactly. It's like, how could that be a base? We know how to draw this, right? Yes. Help me out. How many? So let's draw it. Nitrogen. How many protons? Seven. Inner shell, correct? Outer shell, right? Covalent bond. Number one, right? Covalent bond number two, and covalent bond number three. So far, so good. Stable, delightful, we call it ammonia. Everything is fine. What's that? Two big, honking, unpaired electrons hanging out in space in the valence shell. You got this huge, negative charge floating on the valence. And it is attracting and tying up hydrogen ions left and right. So it turns into this thing called NH4+. Plus. Called ammonium. Just like OH, it hoovers up the hydrogen ions out of the solution because it has these big unpaired negative electrons in the outer shell. So it's like, how do you be how do you be a base? It's like the easiest way to be a base is to just throw hydroxide ions out into the shell. Another way you or out into the solution, another way to be a base is to have unpaired valence electrons that can attract the hydrogen ions as well. Because being a base, although as much as we would love to think of being a base as being something that adds hydroxide to a solution, that's not really what it means to be a base. What it means to be a base is to like hoard protons out of the solution. And this does it. This does it. It doesn't do it by donating hydroxide. It does it by attracting the hydrogen ions. Does that make sense? So it's like, it looks like it should be an acid, but it's actually a super strong base. And now we have this ammonium thing, NH4, which acts like a molecular cation that we can bond anions to, like chlorine, and have like ammonium chloride and stuff like that. We can form ionic bonds with it after we do acid-base reactions with it. Raise your hand if you're having fun with chemistry. It's not bad, you know? It's like, when you kind of do it this way, it's like one person raised their hand for the record. <laughs> Two if you count me. Bro, I got you. We're gonna have a lot of fun with chemistry. It's gonna be great. The chemistry in this class doesn't go like beyond this in like pure chemistry. I mean, next time in class, we're gonna be talking about like carbohydrates and lipids and all that jazz. So um, we don't, I mean, memorizing this is not the point, it's like, we're tying together these concepts of like covalent bonds, electronegativity, bond polarity, electrostatic attraction, what the consequences of valence electrons, what water does in solution. I mean, this is day one of this class? Three? You guys have done like a huge amount of content in this class in the last three days. And you keep coming back. Question? Um, so you said those two electrons 
They're, sorry, they, they are paired. They are unbound. They are unbound. And I misspoke. I just spoke. Yeah, they're, they're, they're paired electrons. They are unbonded to anything else. Free, we would say free, un, free, free paired electrons in the valence shell. Good, 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 good call. Question. So I don't know, but I don't know if we already went over this already, but question 18. I just wasn't 100% sure about. What property of carbon makes it essential for organic life? Here's the Tinker Toy question. You know, we were talking about Tinker Toys. Is it the, um, I don't know if this is right. Is it um, the carbon chains? It, um, it makes chains and rings, but it can you can make a bunch of molecules out of it because how many covalent bonds can it make? Up to four. Four, right? At all kinds of weird different angles. So it's the ultimate Tinker Toy connector. And so because you can make such diverse structures, you can make complicated yeah. things like you. Uh, DNA. The DNA. And you. Question? Number nine. Number nine. Yeah. Is it decreasing? It's increasing. It's increasing. Acids are added to a solution, the pH. Increase. No, decreases. Increases. Decreases. Decreases. Yeah. It's number nine. Acids are added to solution. The pH goes from seven to Zero. down, right? So pH decreases when acids are added. When bases are added, pH. When nothing is added, pH stays at seven. Go ahead. Which of the following statements is true? Acids and bases cannot mix. Acids and bases neutralize. Yes. Acids, not bases, can change the pH of a solution. They can both do it. Acids donate hydro. You know, last one's totally wrong. Acids and bases cannot mix together. When you mix acids and bases, what happens? They um, Yeah, I don't like this question like because it's like you can you can mix them, but it's like if they mix on their own, um, you that? get. Uh, so. I don't have any room. I don't have any room in orbit time. Uh, acid, sorry, base, and you mix them together, you get a water molecule and a salt. So I can't. Yeah, so it's like they, they don't, if they mix, they don't exist as an acid and a base. They will always turn into a salt and a water molecule. And it'll get really, 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 really hot. It's really hot. So the answer would be acids and bases neutralize each other. And in the process of neutralizing, make water, a salt, and they get really hot. So if you mix like really strong hydrochloric acid and a really strong sodium hydroxide together, it's like that too will get like, don't touch it, hot. Super hot and sometimes like sometimes explosively. Cool. Um, do you want to hang on to your homework for one more day, or do you want to turn them in? Yeah, yeah. If you want to turn it in, I'll take it. Um, if you want to hang on to it for just a little bit longer and turn it in Thursday, I'm okay with that too. Turn in everything that you're supposed to turn in. <laughs> I don't maybe I have some smarties, chalk. Good. Sadly I don't, but that should be okay. Did you receive my email? Uh, with, uh, with one, two, one, I did. I did. Yeah, you're good. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Let me just make a chaotic pile. Have a nice day. Bye. And here's the answer sheet, by the way. I think that looks Wait, we just turn in this.